Can I, you ready? Okay. Can I have a quick show of hands as to who was at yesterday's presentation? Okay, that's good. No, no, it's a different one. Oh, but it uh, means I don't have to use, I've got to use different jokes, that's why, so. <laughs> well, I'm sure they were so good they're willing to hear it again, right? No, so, some of the concepts we'll cover, uh, I covered yesterday as yeah, well, I so it's just. I see that one, but I missed it. I that's, no worries, because it, it will, I've got to work out with TDI, I think they're going to be available online somewhere. I would like them to be anyway, because um, I'm not precious about this, because it's, it's about life skills. Um, and so thank you very much for coming. Um, I don't know what you think this presentation is going to be about, but you know, my idea is, is to educate you guys, have some fun, uh, and realize that we're all human, we all make mistakes, and it's the simple mistakes that start to compound together that actually lead us to the accidents. Um, there was a presentation at 11 o'clock with Carl Shreves, and he used the quote, um, it wasn't his, um, the choice to die. And, and what I want you to realize by the end of this is people don't choose to die. We don't get up in the morning and say, tell you what, today's a good day to die. Not unless you're suicidal. And that isn't what the majority of us are about. Error, human error is complex. And we don't understand because we're never exposed to it in the, in the sort of um, environment to, to learn from that. Uh, and the diving community is rubbish about talking about the incidents and why they happened. We're very quick to go, it's his fault, it's his fault, sue him, it's his problem, you know. We don't understand the context, and that's what this presentation's about as well. So my background, I spent 25 years in the Royal Air Force as a flight instructor, uh, and I left February last year on C-130 Hercules, uh, teaching low-level and tactical uh, MVG operations. Um, I went through a uh, systems engineering background, uh, and got a master's in systems engineering, and about five years ago, I was getting a lot of research and annoying quite a few people in the diving industry because I was pointing out issues that in aviation we'd learned 30 years ago um, and trying to bring them into the diving community. It's like, no, 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 it doesn't make sense. So I started a self-funded part-time PhD looking at the role of human factors in diving accidents. Um, in terms of diving qualifications, advanced trimix through GUE and a uh, CCR uh, mod one through uh, TDI. Um, February this year, January this year, I deployed the first human factors or crew resource management program for divers. Uh, and it was to try and bring that uh, knowledge and skills into the diving community. Uh, and my other, one of my other hats uh, for GUE, Global Underwater Explorers, I'm the director for risk management, trying to bring a lot of performance development in there. And I write quite a lot in, well, this is a journal for one of the um, agencies in the UK, and this is for the diver medic, the, uh, the last article. Uh, and it was trying to get people to be less judgmental. So, I'm going to show you a quick video, and, and just to show you that we judge based on outcomes. There's a lot of similarities being drawn between wingsuit flying and, uh, and technical diving recently. Largo forse sia cosa sarà due metri, due metri e mezzo, due metri wide. That went 60, 70. So, what would your thought been? Well, what, what's your initial thought there? Cool? Really good? <laughs> what, what if he'd, uh, well, and we'll come to that in a sec. So, what would your thought been if he'd gone splat on the wall? <laughs> Why? Why would you say cool? Well, because the, the industry that I'm actually in most of my life, that's the cool stuff you get to see. So, yeah. What, the, the splat people? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, would put you, I would put you somewhere on like this, this outlier curve. You'd be like somewhere over there in that sense. <laughs> Job security, that's, that's cool. Um, but, you know... He made it through, and, and actually prior to this, the, the video is a cut down from what's available online. The previous day, he flew down on the other side of that ridge and was going to try and cut through and went, no, I can't do it. So he practiced and done a, you know, a bit of a recce in and understood what the risks were, and he changed his behavior as a consequence. Um, but you know, it would only taken a second or so beforehand to be slightly off and 
hit the wall doing 150 miles an hour, dead. And we'll come back to wingsuit flying at the end of this presentation. So, you know, we judge things based on the outcomes. When we see a diving fatality, the first thing is, idiot, why did you do that? Oh! <laughs> Siri is really cool. <laughs> Unintended consequences of technology. <laughs> So when, when we, we look at these things, when we see an accident happen and we look at it and go, oh, it's obvious, but actually there's a backstory to that that we need to understand. And this comes on to the next bit where we have hindsight. We can see what happened, and so we start judging based on this. So I want you to watch this video and, and start thinking about what's going to happen. And as it plays, there's some pauses, or I'm going to ask you what's going to happen next. Ooh. and loving the IT. Did it work? Yeah. It was now it is. Oh man, right. Hey, right. Okay, shout out what you think's gonna happen. It's gonna get run over. Yep, so we're lifting the, lifting the, uh, the backhoe here. Oh, this guy here. Anything else? So the, the straps are gonna cut in half. This guy here, okay. So this guy's gonna get Hit. Okay. Okay. And you love the blood zone. The blood zone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who thought it was going to roll down the hill? Honestly. One person. I know Rennie did. Have you seen it before, Rennie? Okay. So, if you were involved in that job, would you have thought to check that the handbrake was on, on the, uh, the backhoe? No. So, when we see these things happen, it's very easy to judge them. And when I see these safety videos, and we get this, so the HSC or the OSHA guys going, ah, stupid, how could they do that? I look at it from the other side and say, why did it make sense to those guys at the time to do this? And it's like, why were they using a, a caterpillar to lift that backhoe up? Well, actually, that might be all they had. You've got to take into context of how they were doing the operation because it made sense to them at the time. They weren't going to sit there. Looking at how they were dressed, it probably wasn't a well-off area. They weren't going to raise that and go, ha, so what? It's going to roll down the cliff. We don't care. Actually, that was probably you know, a lot of money in terms of what was there. So it made sense to them at the time. Ultimately, So you had a, a, a brilliant word there, should. And we'll come to that in a minute. Should, could, would. And, we'll come, and, and in hindsight, it's very easy to use that. Um, but you're right. Yeah. Because in other situations where they haven't used that shackle type situation, it's been stropped. So you know from previous experience, I'm guessing you've got a lifting construction yeah. back. Yeah. So you've got some mentality of that. But what you see is all there is. Um, the reason why I asked about the question everybody who's been here before yesterday Everybody got a pen? Okay. Right. You're going to try this again. Okay, right. I want you to hold the pen. Oh, everybody, oh, quick, get the pen. I want you to hold a pen up. This is, what's this about? Right, <laughs> it was him, actually. <laughs> Not you. Right, I want you to point the pen at the ceiling. I want you to draw, because you yesterday you didn't get it. I want you to draw a clockwise circle. Keep pointing at the ceiling. Keep the pen pointing at the ceiling. And then gradually lower your hand. Still keep the pen pointing to the ceiling. Lower your hand down until it's sort of level. The direction of that pen, has it appeared to have changed or not? It's going anti-clockwise now. How did that work? Oh, really? Yeah, so it goes clockwise there. You bring it down. It's now going anti-clockwise. That's cool. <laughs> and it's about changing your perspective on things. <laughs> this didn't. There you go. Draw, draw clockwise. 
bring it down, look on top of the pen, it'll be going anti-clockwise now. When we look at accidents, we need to take the perspective of the person that was involved in the environment they're in, the skills they had, the knowledge they had, and often it's very different to what you've got. Okay, DJ, you can stop now. <laughs> and this bit here brings it up you know, quite nicely that this guy's definitely, he's got three. No, no, it's four. When Carl was talking about violations, that infers there's a rule. Now, in diving, there are, there are so many different standards of what is right or wrong. And so it's very easy to judge other people based on your own perspective. This guy here, Sidney Decker, has done loads of work in human error and human performance. And we have this situation where, after the event, we can see what went wrong. In this case, a bomb going off. But we live a life in a little bit of a tube. We, we have a limited view of the world. And that view will come onto in a minute as part of your situational awareness. You can't see what the outcomes are because you've got a limited ability to look into the future. You can maybe look two or three steps. You know, master chess players are looking at sort of 10 or 12 moves ahead. Beginners, two, three at most. That's the same in the rest of life. We haven't experienced that situation. Our ability to project into the future is limited. And this came from a, uh, an inquiry in the UK, the, the hidden, well, he was QC, the, the, the legal guy. Um, there is almost no human action or decision that cannot be made to look flawed and less sensible in the misleading light of hindsight. Essential that the critic should keep himself constantly aware of the fact. It is so easy to look back and go, it was obvious that that was going to happen. But we've got, we know what the outcome is. We know what all of those things that led to it. When you're in that situation and you look forward, you don't have that knowledge of that outcome. And this is where, when you said, if he had, would, or should, could, why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? Well, he didn't. There's not a lot we can do about that. You know, it's happened. What we need to understand is, why did it make sense to that person at the time? Carl's presentation, we're talking about lots of violations. Why do people break the rules? A lot of it's down to risk perception. We're unaware of what might happen, realistically. And this comes on to this concept, we don't know what we don't know, or this uh, incompetent and unaware. There was a study done by these guys, Dunning and Kruger, um, across a number of different fields, which was maths, grammar, different English joke telling. And they were assessed at the end of the test as to how well they thought they did. And that's what these lines here are on both of these graphs. So they broadly, as, as, as a sort of the community that took part as they were actually graded, this is what they thought they scored. So everybody was in the order of, if we go down to about 51 through to about 65, 70%. That's what they all thought they scored. And then when you look at the grades that they actually scored, those in the bottom quartile, they were about sort of 15%. And we can see that these are what the real scores were. Now, the worst bit is, it's not just the fact that they didn't, you know, they didn't score very well, is that they didn't know that they didn't score very well. They had this flawed concept of confidence that's there. We don't like to put ourselves down. Now, the difference here is those who are experienced, who are in the top scorers, they underestimated their abilities. And so they said, no, I didn't, didn't, didn't think I did so well. And actually, they were up in this sort of the 85% mark. So what you find is that novices overestimate their abilities and experts underestimate their abilities. The second part of this Dunning-Kruger effect is that the experts forget what it's like to be down at this end of the curve. So you turn around and go, oh, it's obvious in the discussion we just had. But why don't people know about embolisms? Well, because maybe they taught it years ago and they've forgotten it. It has no relevance because it hasn't happened to them and they've forgotten that knowledge because they don't encounter it all the time. I read a lot of accident reports and you think, oh, that's obvious. Why didn't you do that? I don't do that now because I try and look at what the backstory is. But it's very easy to read these stories and go, duh, stupid. But actually, it made sense to them at the time. And that's the downside. We need to educate people to realize that they are fallible, that we've got to teach people to deal with failure and, and human error. What's the sample there? Uh, no, this was, um, I'll find out what the numbers are afterwards. But it was in, it was in the hundreds. Um, but it was, it was splitting into the bottom quartile of the scores uh, from there. And, and it could be sort of simplified as this graph here, 
where when you first learn to do something, your confidence is way up here. But you've got very limited experience and knowledge. Um, and so I can do this. And my story, my dives, nine and 10, were in San Diego, in Wreck Alley, as an open water diver, 30 meters, having had to sign a secondary waiver because I was only open water qualified, uh, to say, yeah, I'll go and do this. And I had no idea that what I was doing. As I descended the anchor line, the, um, uh, the low pressure hose collar slipped off the, uh, the nipple on the, the, the hose. And I'm like, oh, it's, that's not working, okay. But I was quite calm. I knew there was a hard deck of 30 meters, so I wasn't gonna go much deeper. Had it been somewhere like the oil rigs, that would have been a bit of a different thing. But, you know, so you sit there and go, okay, pff, hit the bottom, go to my buddy and go, this doesn't work, get fixed. And I was completely unaware of what situation I was in because that was it, just. Well, yeah, and, and that, I put that not panicking down to my military aviation background of going, right, well, I know that I'm not going to disappear into the abyss. Had been somebody who's not got that sort of mentality, it may have gone of a very pear-shaped. Now, they wouldn't have rocketed to the surface because they've got no gas. So, <laughs> the driving a wetsuit. But, you know, so there's always a, a silver lining to things. But, you know, we make those decisions based on the experiences and knowledge we've got. And I had died, I certified in 99, in 2000, spring of 2005, I did one dive in South Africa, and then two, uh, a month later, I did the, the remainder of five dives. So I hadn't dived for a long time either. It's all right. You know, first thing I did, I bought a dive computer. Hey, well done. I have something shiny in my wrist. Great. You know, and, and that, you know, when I walk around the halls here, the amount of stuff that is for sale compared to what could actually help people is, is somewhat frustrating. <laughs> Sweeping generalization. But I'm going to show you how difficult it is to spot some of the things that are going on. If you've seen the video coming up, please keep quiet. Um, there are some questions in it, uh, and there'll be some questions at the end. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. So it's a fairly simple task. Basketball's being passed between the white players count passes between the white shirts. How, How many passes? 13. 13? <laughs> How many passes? How many else get 13? 14, 15? Okay. Any, any raises on that? Any passes did you count? The correct answer okay. is 15 passes. And now for the man who spoiled it. Did but you see did the you gorilla? See Hands the up gorilla. if you saw the gorilla. Okay. How many have seen it before? Good, thank you for being honest, brilliant. This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher. So, you know, that was the task you got given was count the passes. The gorilla isn't something you're expecting to see because it's something different. Now, there's some other stuff now. So, how many plant pots were in the scene? How many flower pots, planters were in the scene? Two, three? Three. three. Raises? Two. Two? Hands up, three? How many thought three were in the scene? Two? How many saw two? I two? Okay, guess two. How many don't know? There were no plant pots in the scene. And when I do this in a close business environment, I normally get the boss to answer three to start with. And then I get his deputy to say three. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, I don't want to be different. We end up with this group think that happens. If you're on a dive boat, if you're in an instructor position and you say something, the students will find it very difficult to challenge what you said, even if they think it's not quite right, because you hold that position. And so the way to change that is you have to bring yourself down to their level. You have to say that, hey, look, I make mistakes all the time. Look, this is one that I made yesterday, this morning, whatever. And show that you are fallible, that you can make mistakes, and you do make mistakes. Because they may have a critical bit of information for you that you haven't spotted because you're doing something else, like looking after them. And when we get that information, it, it drives our interests. And that's what this next bit is about, situational awareness. In, in, the, um, in the manuals, it says, oh, you've got to have good situational awareness underwater. 
What is situational awareness? Somebody shout out what do they think it is. Ooh. Well, it must be really easy then because everybody's supposed to have it, but yet we can't define it. Go on, Maureen. Point, point two, one. Sorry? Point two, one. Yep. That's not situational awareness. Okay, and so what? And so if you are, if you realize that you are the weakest link and that you should not be diving, then you should not be diving. And because if you are, say for example, queasy, then boom, maybe you shouldn't be diving. Or let's say that the boat is rocking a little bit too much and you're, and again, back to personal responsibility, you're unable to get on and off the boat safely, maybe you should not enter the water. Or C, um, if, let's say you're not used to being in an environment that is, say, shark infested and it's going to make you quite nervous, maybe you should not get into that shark infested water. So it's the, the collection of information now, how you perceive it, what it means to you right now. Being able to respond to something that you're able to sort of see what's around. So you can, it's this next bit, this projection, and this is this bit that everybody can do this, they sense the information. <clears throat> The more experience you have is you can start to process that, comprehend it, and say, this is what it means. Those who've got lots of experience are able, able to project into the future, and they're able to create those models of the future and say, this is what's going to happen based on the information I have. Now, that's all very well, but it's all influenced by what your goals and objectives are and your preconceptions and your expectations. If I do this... I expect a certain response. And so if in a case of shark infested waters, uh, or actually I'm jumping into water, that I don't expect anything to happen. So I'm not looking for the bad things to happen. Same in the, say, in the case of the gorilla. I, I'm not expecting the gorilla to walk across the scene. So I'm not gonna go looking for it. If you've got a lot of drive, those uh, objectives and goals, that will start shaping to say what's important for you in terms of getting your task done. If you're doing a, a photography or a videography task, that's what is important to you right now. And so actually you limit your ability to see what else is going on around you. But this is where abilities, experience and training at the bottom come in because you've now got that bigger library of models, experience to rely upon and say, ah, when I was, so that the guy, uh, talk about the crane, uh, knows that the straps shouldn't just be hung over the teeth of the, the digger bucket because they've got a likely of popping off. Now, those guys didn't recognize that because they've never seen those straps pop off a bucket before. Otherwise, they would have probably done something about it. So we have this long-term memory store that we refer to, and that's why experts are better at making decisions as long as they get the good information to start with. We make the decision, we, we execute it, and then we have a feedback loop that goes back and says, well, actually, we've done something, something's changed, what's changed, how can we adapt that? Uh, and we go round this loop, or in fact, round in here. But in terms of making the job easier or harder, we've got this external stuff. So interface design, if you have a poor interface for your dive computer, one of the bits where you cycle through and then you get to the point where you go, ah, oh, I've now got five menus to go back to. And, and so you get frustrated and so that reduces your workload. Designing things to be simple is, is quite hard because engineers, and we'll show later on, engineers are very intuitive, you know, they've got an idea of how things work, but they are not the users and it's trying to get stuff out to the front line for people to use it uh, so they can see how they can break it. Um, there is a paradox in terms of automation that as you make things more automated, um, your training burden potentially goes up, not down, because we can't make things ultra-reliable, especially in the diving community, because we don't have enough money to do that sort of thing. Well, we do, but the consumer won't pay for it. Um, so we have failures that happen. Team members have their own situational awareness within here. It's where that overlaps is where the team situational awareness. And there were some studies looking at um, in a college playground. They uh, had students using mobile phones or digital devices. And they had a clown cycling on a unicycle through the playground and see whether or not people could spot it. When they were on their own, 75% of the students missed this unicycling clown going past. 
When they had two people together, it was only 25% people missed it. The chances of both people being fixated on the task at the same time is why team diving is so important. Not same ocean diving where you jump in and go, hey, there they go. It's actually working together as a team. And our decisions are based on our long-term memory stores. And it's the stuff that sticks in our memory, emotionally significant stuff. And unfortunately, it's not the bad things that we remember. We don't remember, if you go back a year when somebody said something to you nice, you know, would you remember that? If they said something really nasty to you, you hold a grudge. You remember those things. And because they've got emotional significance, unfortunately, the human tendency is that bad stuff we remember because, you know, I suppose historically that actually if it tastes bad or it hurt you, you probably want to remember it and avoid it. So we can remember stuff in the short term, but it might be there's some stuff in the, the, the long, your long memories that are quite important that we need to reinforce. Now, one of the ways to uh, improve that decision-making we have is to use checklists. And, uh, and I love Calvin and Hobbes, he's brilliant. And, and, and some of the pilots I fly, yeah, it's a bit like that. But in diving, there's only been one published study looking at the use of checklists, and that's in recreational diving. Um, oops, I'll go back to this one. Uh, and this was a paper here that, um, that Dan sponsored and put together. Um, these are a couple of the uh, rebreather checklists from Paddy and the one that uh, Global Underwater Use underwater explorers use with the JJ. Um, and this is, is signed off as you build it, and this is cross-checked when you get to the site. Um, for the study they did, there was a reduction in the number of accidents they had. Um, in the order of uh, 25 dives in one group, um, they reduced them um, by having a checklist. Those who didn't have a checklist had, funny old thing, the greatest improvement in the number of issues that were detected. Because actually, in the study, only just under 7% of divers used a checklist pre-diving. Now, those who've been out on liverboards or long, you know, where you go away, it just doesn't happen. Because people can do it from memory. Go on. Was that, was that, are they saying a physical... A physical checklist. checklist. Yeah, it was a physical piece of paper. Some people have a mental checklist or a systematization of how they do certain yeah. things. I, I would consider that a checklist. So, when I, the, the next slide is talking about rebreather checklist, and, and it's a valid, very valid point. The community does not have a definition of what a checklist is. Um, so when you say checklist, do you mean build at home? Do you mean on-site checks? Do you mean pre-dive? What do you mean? So there is this bit about what is the definition of checklist. But in this case here, it was a written bit of paper that basically went through, and it was a double-blind study, um, which meant that you couldn't examine the social interactions that were required. People didn't know whether or not they were part of the study or not. Um, but it did have a positive effect. Research that I was doing started in February this year, looking at the use of checklists in rebreather diving. And there was a quote that came up from rebreather forum three where, I've never found a checklist on a dead diver. OK, well, that's not very useful, because there are lots of checklists in aircraft that pile into the ground. Um, you know, just because you've got a checklist doesn't mean that you're going to be safe. Um, the two parts of the study actually uses why they use them or not, what's the, the, the enablers and barriers to checklists used in rebreather diving, and actually looking at the checklists themselves from the manufacturers. Four sides of letter is not a checklist, but that's what some of the pre-dive build checklists are about because they're making up the limitations of the training that's there. And one of the questions was looking at the instructors, how often they use them in training versus their own fun diving uh, when they were instructing. And when they were instructing, 25% of those instructors used a checklist more in training than they did in their own fun diving. And then the follow-on question was, well, okay, if you did that, why? Because of litigation and because the training standards say I must do. Now, from my point of view, as an instructor, you'd probably brief that as, I'm going to teach you about checklists because I have to teach you about checklists. And this is what it's about. Oh, and by the way, now go and write your own checklist because these ones are rubbish. Well, actually, what's the value of that checklist? And if the instructor's not using a checklist, go on, Maureen. Why wouldn't they, they meaning instructors and instructor organizations, uh, utilize a checklist in order to uh, facilitate competency 
within the ability to do the task correctly. So one of the bits, you know, one of the questions was, you know, it was, it's, checklist was seen as a liability limiting exercise. Both half the instructors and half of the sample population considered checklists to be a liability limiting exercise. And the point is that checklists are not the complete solution. But you, don't they set a, a, a minimum standard and that you can then move forward from? The assumption is that the checklist is fit for purpose. So if you have... That it is fit for purpose. It is fit for purpose. So if you have four sides of letter as your checklist before you go diving, as in fact that final point here, if you don't make it easy to use, it won't get used. Having somebody to get something out that's four sides of letter to use before you go diving, pff, I'm going to find my own way to do that because humans are naturally efficient. Now you could say that's cutting corners, but we have in presentation yesterday we have a migration to risky behaviours because it's easy to do that. We, don't, we are normally time poor. Um, we may have some money to buy stuff and do it, but actually we're normally time poor. So anything that we can save to cut down time is seen as an efficiency. And when it doesn't go wrong, it's considered safe. And how many times does it have to be that it doesn't go wrong before it then does and you realize that actually it was a good idea? Go on, Nick. So part of, the, part of the, the study was looking at what is a checklist and how it's made up and, and actually taking stuff, because nobody's actually done any work as to design effective checklists. Every manufacturer has a different way of doing it. The training agencies have checklists on top of the manufacturer's checklist. So there's no consistency using best practice from people like Aviation who've been doing this for years. And there's a book that's really well worth reading. It's called The Checklist Manifesto, caught by a guy called Atul Gawande who headed up the World Health Organization's Safe Surgical Checklist. And they halved the fatalities that they had based on using pre-surgical checklists. And they were simple things like, have I got the right patient? Have I got the right leg? Have I got the antibiotics done? And people are like, what? And yet we still have wrong site injuries. And a colleague of mine was at a, uh, observing the surgical theater where they got the wrong patient and they'd got them spun round because they were covered in drapes and it was a spinal operation. Uh, and it was like, whoa, stop. And the reason why the WHO safe surgical, check, safe surgical Checklist worked is because they empowered the nurses to say, stop. And there were some big arguments between the surgeons and the nurses um, because the surgeons were like, we are doing this. And the, the nurses have been empowered by the hospital administrations to say, you can stop this, and if the surgeon gives you grief, come and see me. Uh, and they proved over eight hospitals globally that they had a massive impact. But it requires a social structure. And this point, this paper here from Ken Catchpole, really nice guy, you know, a checklist reliant on teamwork for success may fail despite all the items being followed because those team skills were insufficient. A checklist is an enabler. Go on. Just to step back one, the author of this book. Oh, Atul Gawande, A-T-U-L-G-A-W-A-N-D-E. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to try to grasp my head around. I'm a, I, I live in a world of checklists. Yep. But that's because that you know they work. They work because they are an enabler for what I'll come on to later: non-technical skills, communication. They in themselves don't save things. What they do is they enable and force communications to happen. Have I got the right patient? Have I got the right site? Have I administered the right drugs? Ticking stuff off doesn't save the patient. Executing the action amongst the team does. And that's where the checklist benefits. It, it, they are an enabler for high-performing teams, not in of themselves. And so yesterday's um, discussion from the, uh, the insurance guys was, if you fill out all your paperwork, you'll be safe. Well, you'll be safe from liability and being sued. You won't necessarily stop the activity going wrong. Um, so it's understanding why the checklist is in place. And if you make it too easy, as you said there, Nick, is you end up with this tick-chasing exercise. We go tick, 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 right, done, I'm safe. Actually, have you actually done those things? No. So it's a question of confidence. I mean, are you confident in having done the task that the checklist actually requires? So it's, are you saying that in some cases that people will actually just check off a task when they actually haven't done 
Oh, yeah, that's human nature. Because if you end up with a, a check that's, you know, four pages of A4 or letter, you go, oh, I've got to do these. You know, actually, what you need to do is you need to be competent, and these are safe, um, uh, last-ditch checks. Now, a checklist has different uses. In the build stage, yes, you can go through that and execute it properly. For a pre-dive thing, what you want to do is make sure your gas is on, you've got the right PO2 in the loop or whatever, but you know, those last ditch things that if you jump off the boat and you're not going to drown straight away, you can resolve the stuff in the water. That's what the final pre-dive check is not about 10 items that you need to do before you get in because people won't do it. And if they don't do it, you may as well not have it. Uh, because it breeds that false sense of security. Um, because people ah, I've complete the checklist, therefore I'm safe. And in fact, on the, um, the last slide, I had some details uh, for my bits about rebreather checklist uh, data. So, 27, from this, the survey that I had, 27% of people who'd used a checklist still had issues when they jumped in the water. Now, either the checklist was wrong, or more likely they didn't execute the checklist properly. Because they don't, they, this risk perception versus benefit, what's the loss, you know, the negative benefit of me not doing this? Well, I haven't encountered anything going wrong, therefore it's, it's okay. So then on the graph showing they don't put in future, possible future events based upon their experience. Yeah, life. previous experience. So, or that they've jumped in and they haven't switched on the O2, but they've managed to do it as they go down the shot line. That's fine because they weren't distracted. But on the next time, they forget to do that, and something else happens that they haven't noticed. They forget to do this, and we end up with adverse situations. So there's this compound risk, that the risk of me not doing the checklist, the risk of the activities that the checklist is there to stop happening occurring at the same time. And we're not able to do that complex additive effect or combinatory effect. So what we need to do is create the situation where checklists, oh, come on, Michael. <laughs> Um, we need to learn from uh, why they're there and, and, and in effect, fail safely. Um, yeah. And, and, and here's a story about how to deal and learn from failure. Um, this book here is another one worth getting, Black Box Thinking by Matthew Said. Unilever were uh, making soap powder in the UK. And the idea was that they had this liquid chemical uh, that was a lot of fat and stuff. Um, and then they injected it into high pressure through some nozzles and it would then make the fluff, the powder that you get for soap powder. The problem was that this was clumping up and it was blocking the nozzles and they weren't getting a uniform size of soap powder. So they employed some very bright mathematicians and engineers and they came up with this brilliant nozzle that looked like this and it didn't work and they were getting really quite frustrated. But because Unilever was also, I got a lot of biologists involved, and they went, well, give us a go, we'll have a go. And what they did was they took a baseline design like this, and then they did 10 iterations of it, and then they tested it, and then they chose the one that operated best. And then they did 10 slight iterations on that, and tested it, and tested it, and tested it. And they had 45 iterations. They had 449 failures, but they came up with the perfect nozzle, which was this shape here at the end. Now, it's about learning from feedback and having that feedback loop that says, that didn't work, why didn't it work, how do we make it better, and off we go. And often we miss that in the diving community by having the debrief and that feedback loop that goes on. Where do you think you are on this curve? I know nothing, I'm an expert, I know nothing. Oh, I'm totally <laughs> um, The green line. Now, when this appeared on Twitter, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Go to the guy, being the sort of data person that I am, found out who initially published it, sent him a, a direct message and said, where's the data behind this? And he went, it's not, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> but. It makes sense, and, and he basically sends it out there. But you know, from a concept of how well we think, you know, it, it sort of uh, covers the, um, the Dunning-Kruger effect. But as I go through my studies, I realize how little I know in, in terms of my own field, 
um, but it's a lot higher than other people do. But you know, so you end up with this continual learning process. But it's recognizing. You asked the question right at the start. How do we know that we're not very good? Well, you've got to be reflective. You've got to look on yourself. You've got to be honest. Um, and you can't critique somebody else until you can start critiquing yourself um, and be honest about your own failures and weaknesses and things. Uh -oh. Imagine what the adrenaline buzz. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know he survived. Did he hit electrical wires? No, he just piled. i tell you what he did is he hit this eight inch tree and took 20 feet off the top of the tree with his body. And so the blood zone, the guys went and recovered this guy. Um, and, and he survived. Um, he was unconscious, taken to hospital. Um, Did you have him in that no, he's, he was in a lot worse state than that. Um, this is the recovery guys, uh, and they found where it was, and they tracked through the forest. And, and they basically, this guy here, Richard Webb, interviewed him. Uh, and this is a blog that I wrote up. And that was that's the first line of the interview um, that uh, that he put together. Now Richard's uh, an ex-U.S. Navy uh, Tomcat pilot, uh, a wingsuit uh, jumper. And the, the, this bit here, test pilots legitimately describe a wingsuit as a high-speed nylon body bag. Um, and trying to get the attitude changed in towards this. And, and there's a lot of, even though you'd think it was obvious that the risk of these things are happening, but people want to push it. And the ability to jump into the sport is really easy. You can just walk into a, uh, a shop, buy a wingsuit, and off you go. Uh, and whereas before it was like a thousand jumps where the guys were pushing the limits, now it's like a couple of hundred and, and they're experienced. Um, and I, I chatted with um, Becky Kagan Schott about that blog that I wrote and saying, well, actually, in the diving community, is the same thing apparent? That we see some awesome video and stills out there where people are going miles into the back of caves, some really deep wrecks, and just some you know, fantastic stuff. What we don't see is all of the blood, sweat, tears, experience, knowledge, failures that happen that are below the surface. And these are two quotes that, that I think you know, sum it up quite nicely. Um, this is Richard Webb again from, from that blog. Um, and this one here was from a guy who wrote a book about tennis players and the fact that amateurs um, lose because the professionals win points, and all they need to do is keep on playing the game, knowing that the amateur is going to fail. Um, but you know, Richard's point here: amateurs train until they get it right; professionals train until they don't get it wrong. And it's a very different attitude. Now, in the wingsuit community, you know, getting it wrong, it's death, uh, as they're finding out. In the diving community, it can be. But as Carl said, you know, statistically, diving is really safe. The difficulty is when it goes wrong, it's, it's somewhat binary. You don't see very many injuries in diving. It's either you're slightly injured or you're dead. And that's the problem. We don't see why those things happen. So in terms of way forward, why focusing on the technical issues? You know, what the, the equipment, and I would talk about the stuff that's out there. We need to improve that just culture, the ability to talk about the failures and the context behind them, even if that means talking about the rules we've broken which is quite difficult in a community that is all about litigation. We need to walk the walk and not just talk it. You know, I, I approached a, a senior uh, training organization instructor and said, why didn't you pre-breathe that rebreather? You're on a, a training course here. Ah, it's OK. I, I pre-breathed it this morning. Yeah, but you've taken the stuff apart. How do you know it works? And he got a bit sort of shirty with me. And then he went, yeah, OK, fair cop. I should have done it. I said, you're the role model. You've got to walk the walk. You don't just have to say, do these things. You've got to tell stories about what happened, why it made sense to you at the time, especially if that means breaking the rules. And this is from Nancy Leveson, uh, who has written loads of stuff on systems theory. We need to understand those causal factors. In Petar de Noble's research, out of air, 41% of situations. And that's his first point. That's his trigger. And I understand he's being pragmatic. But to me, 
Running out of gas is an outcome. It's not a causal factor. We've got to understand why it made sense and what happened to do that. And to a certain extent, that's why I put the courses together that I have done. And at the end of the tables, there is a, uh, a leaflet with a discount code for the online class. And this is just a little plug at the end. Um, I, I run a, a, an online class, which is um, nine modules, about 15 minutes each, which can be taken whenever you want uh, online. Uh, and then a two-day classroom-based class, which I had a couple of, um, I've had probably four or five of the uh, technical training agencies, their training directors come along and learn lots on it. Uh, and I'm running class for the National Park Service in a week's time, which is all about challenging people in stressful situations and has nothing to do with diving. It's about flying a space-based simulation around a table with a team of four people and a team of two observers. And the observers are to debrief the guys in non-technical skills or human factor skills. Um, and that would basically is my plug for the, the end uh, for the courses. Um, but from that point, I'll take any questions. Maureen. How does one go about then as an instructor to, um, you know, when you look at casual factors that uh, go wrong and you know, it's almost like a series of unfortunate events that lead to tragic results. So how do we stop, you know, in the instructor basis, how do we stop with all these like little casual mistakes that so happen? You, so correct them at the time. So either correct them at the time or sit down and have a debrief. And that's one of the, the, the skills that we teach in the class is how to debrief a mission or a dive effectively. <clears throat> Most debriefs are what went wrong. Well, actually, if you ask the question what went wrong and nothing went wrong, the value of that question disappears quite quickly and then people don't do debriefs. They actually go around the what went well, why did it go well, and what can we improve on? And go around the team and ask them what, what they saw, what was different. Because actually going through, talking through what the objectives of the dive, well, for a start, you've got to have a plan and some objectives. Go through them. Did you meet them? Why didn't you meet them? What would we do to get there? And if you're going to do start bigger dives, um, like expedition type stuff, what was the biggest risk we took on that dive? Because invariably you end up taking, not cutting corners, being efficient, whatever. Um, things don't always go to plan, but you're not going to throw a dive when the little things go wrong. There will be some things that go wrong. Understand what was the biggest risk we took and move forward. Okay, Anything else? Hopefully it's a bit of thought-provoking stuff for you now. Um, on that site, the humanfactors.academy, there is a blog on there, uh, and I'm going to be starting writing for X Ray and a number of other people as well. So um, there's, I'm open to questions at any time, so come and find me. But thank you very much.